Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the organizers to uh, give me the chance to entertain you about some experimental uh, stuff here. So it's not the first experimental talk, so you, are, you uh, know what you're exposed to, more or less. Uh, so what I will speak about is uh, um, uh, 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 things we do uh, in, in our lab in Nice uh, when we basically use laser-cooled atoms and we throw photons at this uh, large cloud of cold atoms. And so we want to uh, understand what's going on. And many different things go on. And uh, just to show you uh, uh, a range of topics which can go on, and uh, this conference going from uh, atomic scales to astrophysics scales, uh, I give you some examples where we hope that we can uh, bridge this gap. So clearly we will uh, use atomic physics uh, information. So this is a cloud of cold atoms we use. It's uh, uh, larger like my uh, fingernail here, one centimeter typically. And uh, we can study many things. I will discuss uh, uh, quite a lot today about uh, what happens if you want to understand the uh, under localization of light and how this might connect to long-range interactions. Uh, but we also can look at what happens if you look at the motion of the atoms. And this is a, a kind of movie what can happen if you throw photons in some regimes. And uh, uh, this is a cloud of cold atoms suspended in vacuum moving along. Uh, I will discuss shortly this. Uh, we also can study. Uh, how photons jump around, and this gives life, uh, rise to uh, Levy statistics, which is also connected to some uh, uh, astrophysical uh, range, and uh, random lasing, where we want to uh, see if random lasing exists in astrophysics. So we do lot, many things where we try to do experiments in the lab, but more and more we try to see uh, what type of systems or configuration can exist in astrophysics, but not all of them connected to long-range physics. Okay, so the first thing I... Uh, I want to uh, explain briefly here, not the main part of my talk, but uh, uh, because this is something we want to investigate in, in future um, in more detail, is what happens uh, on the motion of the position of the atoms if the photons bound, uh, bounce around in the cloud of cold atoms. So this is my cloud of cold atoms. So consider that you are all atoms, and I throw photons at you. What will happen? So uh, <clears throat> one first thing which will happen is that this photon, one photon jumps on one atom, and then it jumps to the other atom. But as the photon jumps from one atom to the other atom, it will push away the other atom because there's gradation pressure. It's like uh, if you have the, the, the light of the, of, the, uh, of the sun going on the uh, tail of the comet, it will push away the tail of the comet. This is the same thing which happens here. So you have, if I have a photon uh, jumping from uh, one atom to the second atom, it will push away this atom. And so it will push it away uh, proportional to the intensity of the light arriving on the second atom. And the intensity arriving on the second atom is a power which is scattered by the first atom divided by uh, the distance squared here. So this uh, leads to a repulsive uh, interaction between the atoms, which scales like a Coulomb force. And so this is uh, well known for more than 20 years now in our community. And uh, one consequence of this is that uh, if you have uh, a few particles in the trap, you have a small size of uh, uh, millimeter size, let's say, and if you, have, if you want to put more and more atoms in this trap, uh, because of this repulsion, the traps get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so this you can easily see, this has been seen, and uh, so this can be mapped on, to some extent to one component plasma situation. It has been considered uh, uh, detrimental and very bad for both eigen condensation, so this is why many people in our community didn't like this type of physics, uh, but we take on this type of physics to study this long-range uh, mechanical forces. Uh, something we've uh, found in our uh, lab is that uh, as we load more and more atoms in this cloud, at some times this cloud becomes unstable and it oscillates, the size oscillates in time. And this is a situation which exists in astrophysics, there are some stars, cepheids, uh, which oscillate in time, there's uh, uh, an instable balance between the gravitational pull to, to get a, a, a small cloud and the radiation pressure in the star which uh, blows up the star. And uh, we get similar things here and we get an oscillating behavior here. There's an instable regime we find in this cloud. And there's a very complex dynamics happening inside the cloud which has been simulated by Thomas Pohl, uh, which uh, maybe some of you know uh, uh, from other type of context. He's working very much on, on Rydberg atoms now and uh, but the tools you use can also be applied to this type of uh, system. Um, so something we also uh, uh, stole from astrophysics, just to see, uh, it's always nice to go to conferences where you don't know most of the people. So you can steal ideas and, uh, and you cite them, but that's all you do. But so you get new ideas and you can get nice papers in your community. So this is an, an idea I stole from astrophysics, uh, uh, which is called photon bubbles. Uh, so uh, close to some uh, uh, accreditation disks here, What's happening in astrophysics is that uh, there's a huge outflow of energy of, li of uh, light, let's say, 
and this blows away the matter. And once the matter is away, this light can ballistically expand. There's no scattering any longer. So the light blows, makes its way free, and it can propagate, and the matter is uh, clumped uh, in other regions. And this is what they call photon bubbles in astrophysics. And uh, so we uh, uh, map this idea on uh, what's happening in cold atoms, and uh, there is the following, that you have an equation of propagation here for the intensity of light. How is light propagating in the system? And here we use just a simple diffusion equation of light. And this diffusion equation of light depends on the, on the density, on the mean free path, so it depends on the matter. If there's no matter, there's no diffusion. If there's a lot of atoms, there will be a lot of diffusion. Uh, and uh, so this is the equation for the light. And this is an equation, uh, as we just heard uh, previously, it's like a, a fluid equation for, for, for matter. And uh, the interaction here, this uh, charge here, is this effective Coulomb interaction, which I just introduced previously. So we have an equation here for the position for the matter, and here an equation for light. And if you couple these two equations, you can find the instability. And this instability uh, uh, leads to the same kind of uh, uh, region where light will be uh, pushing away the atoms. And so this is what we call photon bubbles in code atoms. And this is uh, uh, something which is uh, used now to explain this type of movies here, uh, <coughs> where this uh, motion of atoms and light is coupled together. And uh, this experiment are now also reproduced in Lisbon. And uh, we explain this type of feature with photon bubbles physics. But I will not go into much detail. This is work in progress. Uh, but so we can look at the, the atomic. The basic idea is that uh, we can look at what happens to the motion of the atoms with one of our uh, squared forces, Coulomb-like forces. And we can reproduce this in the lab. OK, but uh, now I want to switch to something else. And it's uh, not looking at the position and the velocities of the atoms, but looking at the internal degrees of freedom of the atoms. Uh, the forces on the atoms actually uh, can be derived uh, from, uh, if I'm an atom, uh, the force acting on me depends on some gradient of the Hamiltonian of the internal dynamics, which is, uh, so I'm an, I'm an atom, a laser comes on me, it will induce a dipole, in, and I will oscillate, and the magnetic field will push me. So there's a, the internal degrees of freedom of the atoms will be coupled to the atomic motion. And so now, from now on, I will not look at the atomic motion. I will just look at the internal degrees of freedom, how this electron on each atom will oscillate, and how this oscillation will be as shared uh, collectively in the large cloud of cold atoms. So uh, one thing which can happen there is that you uh, can find uh, a different regime of how light can stay uh, in the cloud. And that's our main goal. We want to look at uh, something which is like a holy grail in the subcommunity, which is under localization of light. And uh, so we want to throw a photon in the system and we want to see how long does the photon stay in the system and what are the mechanisms of a photon staying in the system. One possibility is just radiation trapping. It's a random walk. And if the, system of the size of the system is very large, it takes long for the photon to escape. But you don't need any interference effect to explain this. Uh, other effects are based on interferences. One is under localization. That's what we want to see. We didn't see it yet. No one has seen it yet, but that's what we want to see. And this would be the idea that if I, you have a, uh, some modes of the system uh, where these atoms here share the excitation, and there's an exponentially localized mode, and the other atoms in the other side of the room, they don't know that we share a mode here. And there's another way how to uh, keep a photon in the system for a long time, and this is what I call Dicke subradiance, which is that we, uh, the photon stays in the system, but we all oscillate together in or out of phase, and this keeps the photon in the system. But we all share the, 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 this excitation. So there are different ways how to store a photon, and we want to understand how we go from one regime to the other. So first, look at the Anderson case, so random walk of photons. So Anderson, uh, the Anderson model, just to put it in the in the context uh, of the last 50 years, uh, uh, was initially introduced for electrons. Uh, and uh, so uh, to explain the transition from a conductor to an insulator, uh, electrons are, uh, have a lot of applications in, uh, in solid state de devices, uh, but they have interactions. And so this makes the situation much more complicated. So people were looking for non-interacting ways to study for uh, this underslocalization. And so what we we'll, uh, do is uh, light, because light is a very nice non-interacting wave in principle. And uh, people have used different type of scattering materials, semiconductor powders, white paint, and we add cold atoms uh, as a scattering material. Um, also, in analog localization, the holy grail is uh, uh, this three-dimensional uh, phase transition because there's a critical disorder. In one or two dimension, most things have understood and have been observed. But in three dimension, it's more difficult because you need a, a critical, a critical uh, disorder strength to localize. And uh, so a lot of theory has been done in the last decades. Uh, but even up to now, there's no macroscopic exact theory of under uh, There's numerical simulations, but there's no analytical theory. Uh, the best we have is kind of self-consistent theor theory of localization. Uh, but this, for instance, gives the wrong uh, critical exponent. So we know that this is not exact, but that's the best we have today. So there's no exact theory on this. And we are, uh, we have, we are uh, 
back to numerical simulations or experiments to, to study these effects. And so these are the two experiments which are the state of the art uh, nowadays. So there's uh, the experiment where they looked at uh, steady state signatures of uh, underslow localization, and this is now considered to be a mass by absorption. So this is no longer uh, a, a proof of underslow localization. And in a time dependent experiment, uh, there was inelastic scattering uh, invo involved here. And so uh, the authors of this paper now all agree that what they saw is no proof of underslow localization of light. So it has not been seen so far, so we can ask a question does it exist? Maybe it does not exist. So it's, uh, and I will show you some uh, theory results of the last years, which might claim that maybe it doesn't exist. So maybe you're looking for something which does not exist. Uh, we don't know yet. We'll see. Uh, so what we did uh, for many years ago now in, in our group in this is that we looked at something which is called weak localization, which is called the precursor of uh, underslocalization. And the idea is that you throw photons at the, uh, the cloud of cold atoms. They scatter. And then we look uh, where they scatter in the, using a camera here. And uh, typically what happens, we see this enhanced backscattering peak, which means that photons, they scatter, they do random walk, and they come back a little bit more in the backward direction than in the average all directions. So this means that the diffusion coefficients get reduced. And the idea is that if this reduction is so strong that the diffusion coefficient will be zero, that's what we call underslocalization. So this is why this uh, enhanced coming back in the in initial direction is a, a precursor of underslocalization. So this works in cold atoms, and so uh, there's theory on this but no exact theory, but there's a kind of a diagrammatic approach which works extremely well. Uh, there's a, a comparison between theory and experiment here. There's no free fitting parameter and it works extremely well. So we have no reason to believe that this diagrammatic approach should not predict exactly under localization. So we were really confident that this works. Uh, and uh, using this type of approach, it t uh, t uh, t told us that we just need to increase the density of the atoms uh, to go for under localization. So we just need to work a little bit in our parameter space to go for higher spatial densities. Uh, we were working the dilute limit. And nowadays, people have done this high densities, but no one has seen under localization. So it's, it's not so easy just increasing density as predicted by this initial diagrammatic approach was not so sufficient to, uh, to make this jump to cross this magic line of under localization. OK, so the, uh, the question is, what is going on? So we need to come back. So it doesn't work easily as we expected. So what can be uh, going on? And so what I will show you now is that uh, we consider now a completely different situation, the same experimental situation, but a different description, different interpretation. And we now consider uh, uh, light as a scattering wave with a 1 over r uh, outgoing wave. And so this is long range uh, part here, which will be important in, in what's coming, uh, which is going on. And maybe this is the key of the difference between under localization and ticket sub, super and subradiance, uh, what is going on in the experiment. OK, so what, what we can do is we, we can come with an external field here. And uh, all these uh, 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 points here are, uh, are our atoms. And every atom here, uh, I can describe it, uh, the evolution of these dipoles, or how this electron oscillates uh, uh, internally. It's driven by an external field. It has some free evolution here. And then, uh, uh, so this is what's happening if uh, the atoms were independent. And then I have this extra term here, which is uh, describing the field scattered by the dipole M going to the dipole J. So this is the rescattered field which couples onto this dipole here. So this is like a, a self-consistent equation here. And uh, this term here is where all the complexity comes in. And here I have this 1 over r uh, uh, decrease. So these dipoles are coupled with a 1 over r coupling term. This is where the long range comes in. And uh, once I solve this equation numerically, uh, I can solve any observable, like the field going out. I can, uh, can compute what can I detect in the experiment. So this, that's easy, an easy step afterwards. But the complexity is coming in here. OK, so uh, uh, what can I do? I can, for instance, compute where the light is going out in all directions. And I see many features here. Uh, I see, like, uh, this is my cloud of cold atoms, light coming in, light going out. So there's a, a very strong uh, intensity around the forward direction here, uh, which can be explained by a mean field. I don't know if it's called a real mean field, but like what I would call a mean field, a description of a, a smooth density distribution of, uh, of particles, like a dielectric uh, a sphere of glass. And this is just a lens. And so this will focus light in the forward direction. That's what I see here. Then there's a, a, a pedestal background here, which I, which I can explain also without taking into account the interference effect. So that would, like a random walk, a diffusion equation, would describe this uh, pedestal here. And then I have this uh, coherent uh, backscattering uh, weak localization peak here, which I described previously. So this simulation. Uh, captures everything I, I, I already described to you. So uh, uh, this uh, simulation is considered more or less exact to some uh, limit uh, for these experiments. OK, so uh, 
then we can look a little bit more detail what happens in this type of uh, equation. So we can, uh, if you have a, an oscillator, you can make different things. You, you can look at the Hamiltonian, you can look at the response function, so you can do this first. So let's look at the Hamiltonian here. Uh, we can have a uh, use an effective Hamiltonian which describes the evolution of each independent atom here, which is the uh, uh, ground state excited state here. And this is the coupling term here, which uh, describes the coupling where the atom uh, photon goes from one atom to the other, so it jumps from atom J to atom I. And this coupling term here uh, is complicated. It has real and imaginary part. There's a phase evolution in there. And uh, it has this long range. It also has short term a short range here, one of our cube, which is a, a, a big uh, issue in our community. Uh, I will come sl slightly back to this, but this is uh, the, complex, uh, the complete uh, description we need, need to take into account. And this looks like an, uh, an Hamiltonian, which is an open system because there's an I over here, and there's an I over here. It looks like an Anders Hamiltonian because there's disorder here because the atoms are positioned at a random uh, location. So this Vij are random numbers here. So it looks a little bit like an Anders Hamiltonian. Uh, and it looks like a couple spins. Uh, it has long-range coupling here, so it has all the ingredients uh, we like to compare what's happening in Anders localization with long-range uh, uh, effects. Okay, and so then we can look at the, if you have an Hamiltonian, you can look at the eigenvalues. So this is a spectrum of eigenvalues, and it shows uh, different uh, things. This is the real part of the eigenvalue, that's the imaginary part. So this corresponds to the lifetime of the mode, and this of the frequency shifts of the modes. And what we can see is that in the dense limit, uh, if you take into account the near field effect, or if you don't take into account just the far field here, if I add near field here, the distribution of this angle is completely different, uh, which is not a surprise. If atoms are very close together, the near field is important. So that's, uh, and this can drastically affect the distribution of, uh, of uh, eigenvalues. And this will have a consequence, uh, as I will show you later. Uh, yeah, so here. So what we can do is we can uh, uh, use this uh, eigenvalues here to make a statistical analysis uh, of uh, what's expected to happen. And so we can look, for instance, if I have all these modes, if these modes overlap or not. And there's a criterion which uh, is called kind of uh, overlap criterion or thoroughness criterion, which uh, tells you if this overlap is uh, increasing or decreasing with the, if you increase the system size, you go to localization or you go to a metallic regime, a conductor regime. And uh, so what uh, has been shown by Sergei Skipetrov and what we also confirmed in our numerics is that uh, if you take the real description with the near field terms, uh, there's no phase transition for light. So this is like a, 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 like a no-go theorem. There might be no localization of light in this type of systems, which is bad for us because that's what we were looking for for many years. So uh, uh, photons have polarization. They have near-field cu uh, coupling for dipole-dipole coupling, and maybe this near-field coupling kills under localization. If you take it away in the model, uh, there is a, a, a crossing here, and uh, the, the, the slope here goes from negative to positive. So in the scalar model, uh, without polarization, without near field, uh, there would be localization. And in the complete uh, model, which describes the real photons, there might be no localization. So this is uh, quite recent, and it might point to a situation where there's no under localization. So that's a, a very a big issue for, for us. Uh, now then, with, uh, together with uh, uh, the people in, in San Carlos, with Romain Bachelard and his colleagues, we looked at the 2D situation on this, and uh, we, we also confirmed that in the vectorial case, there's no localization. In the scalar case, there is localization. But what we found also is that time and space needs to be considered differently. You cannot just look at the time dependence of what's happening to uh, infer of, uh, what is spatial localization. Uh, for instance, here, there's the lifetime of the modes of these eigenstates and the localization length, they're not correlated. So it's not because you have a long lifetime that you have a, a spatially localized mode or vice versa. So we need to discuss space and time localization differently, which has not done in the literature before. Okay, so uh, now the other thing is uh, this long-range dipole-dipole coupling. So for now, we seem to say that Anders localization does not exist. So let's look for Dicke subradiates, the other way how to store a photon in the system for many, many uh, lifetimes. And so the, the, this is just a reminder of what Dicke did in the 50s. So he took a situation where you have uh, N two-level systems, and he treats the total uh, Hilbert space here. And so they have, uh, for instance, here one state where all the atoms are in the ground state. Here there's one state where all the atoms are in the excited state. Uh, in this here, there's one excitation, two excitations. So this is a full Hilbert space. And what he showed that if you start from the fully inverted system here, there's a ca cascade to the ground set here, which is much faster if you have many uh, dipole, many, many two-level systems than if you have an individual uh, single atoms. And this experiment, this has been seen in the experiment in the 70s. 
so this is called super radiance. So this cascade here uh, uh, grows very quickly because of, there's a stimulated emission process uh, in this cascade. So this has been seen. Uh, this is uh, working well. So what we focus on now is on the single excitation here. So we don't start from a fully inverted system. We just want to have one excitation in the system and see how this propagates and stays in the system. And so even in this case here, uh, there's a, a, a N uh, time enhancement for the decay rate of the symmetric state. So if you have a single excitation, and if all this excitation were in phase, let's say, then this would decay N times faster than a single atom. And uh, this, uh, we have to pay a price for this. This means that all the other states here, they do not decay. And so they have a long lifetime. So this is what they, I call subradiant state, and this fast decaying state is superradiant state. And uh, so this has been done by the, in the Dicke paper in the 50s. Uh, we extend this now to a regime where the size of the system is much larger than the wavelengths. And so this scaling n is no longer uh, scaling with the particle number, but it's scaling with the particle number divided by the number of optical modes available in the system. Which means if, I, uh, if we have all uh, a photon to get uh, out of the room here, uh, it depends on how many doors do we have to get uh, the photon out of the room. And how many doors there are, it depends on how many lambda squares I can fit on the, on the surface of, on, the, on the roof. And so this number of optical modes here, and so we define a cooperativity parameter, which is the number of atoms divided by the number of optical modes which can go out of the system. And so this is the same as in cavity QD, it's number of particles which share the same mode. And this number here, I like it very much because this is also the only resident optical thickness is something I can measure in the experiment. So this is a, a, a theory number, a criterion, which can be experimentally measured. So that's why I, I, I like this number very much. Okay, so uh, subradiant, uh, has, subradiant has been studied in the past for two particles. If you take two atoms close together, uh, then the, the two dipoles can either oscillate in phase or out of phase. And uh, there's been experiments in the 90s uh, done by uh, the group of Brewer where they could take two ions and put them very close together. And they saw a change in the lifetime. So this dotted line here is the single atom lifetime. And they saw a reduction of this light lifetime if the atoms come close together. This means there were, uh, it's one state which oscillates out of phase. And that's what they saw. But this works uh, if the atoms are very close together. It's not exploiting the long-range nature of this interaction. So uh, there's been one experiment where they... Uh, claimed some subradiance in forward direction, uh, but uh, it was like a pencil ex excitation. So the laser comes here, and in the forward direction, they saw a little a slight change. But the main problem here is that photons can escape in the other directions, and then they do not live in the system for a very long time. If you want to make a, a, a situation where the photons stay in the system for a long time, there needs to be no exit door at all, in no direction. So uh, you need a three dimensional uh, spherical or cubic uh, situation. So uh, this uh, subradiance is difficult to observe. Uh, it, is, it does not require large spatial density. It requires a large uh, uh, cooperativity parameter. But so you can have many, many atoms far away, uh, but so, so the only parameter is the optical density. It's not the spatial density. So you can, uh, uh, if you want to have a large optical density, even if the atoms are far away, you ju just need more particles. But you can create a large system without having atoms very close together. So they don't feel the near-field interactions, but you need to, the, the price you have to pay is you have to have more and more particles in your system. And so uh, that, that's what we can do. So we, we need a, a large optical thickness, and we exploit this one over our long-range coupling. That's what we, what we exploit in our uh, situation. And so we did some numerical simulation. So the idea is that you start with the ground state, and then you come with a laser beam. You excite it mainly to this superradiant state, and there's some coupling to this uh, subradiant metastable dark states here. And then you switch off the laser, and then we want to see how the light comes out. And what we computed here is that we expect a faster decay here, and then some tail here, which would be the slow decay of the subradiant state. And so uh, uh, we have to distinguish subradiance from under localization and from uh, random walk. And there are some scaling laws how this time scale should scale. So subradiant should scale like this cooperativity parameter, which I just introduced. Radiation trapping is, would scale like the optical uh, thickness at the laser frequency squared. And under localization, maybe like an exponential. So that, uh, but there's no precise theory on this. But so this is uh, what we expect for Dicke subradiance uh, as, uh, in contrast to a radiation trapping. And so uh, we do the experiment. We come with a laser beam here, uh, switch everything off, and look at the scattered light on the detector. 
So we are experts in, in this of creating large cloud of code atoms. So it's, uh, for you, this is not a, a big issue, but this is among the largest cloud of code atoms you can see. So we, uh, that's our expertise. Uh, we can go even more than this. We can go now up to 10 to the 11 or 10 to the 12 atoms trapped. So we can cr create very large cloud of cold atoms in the dilute limit where the near field coupling is not important. That's very uh, important here. OK, and so this is the experiment. So when we switch off our laser, uh, most light goes out very quickly. And then there are these tails here, which uh, really depend on the optical thickness. If I change this optical thickness here, uh, the photons stay in longer. If I change the tuning, the slope does not change. So it not, does not depend on the detuning. Uh, and if I put all this data together, I get a universal scaling, which shows us the lifetime here, scales like the optical thickness. So it scales like the system size. So it's a, it's a, s a global effect. It's not a local effect. It's not a dense effect. And uh, so this is uh, exactly what we expect from super radiance. And this is different from what you expect from uh, uh, radiation trapping. And uh, this is, uh, is uh, uh, probably the first observation of this uh, thicker subradiance in a large system uh, in, three, in three dimensions without the cavity. OK, so, um, so that's OK. So now we have the thicker uh, subrange, subrange we have seen. We know that there must be super radiant peak as well, because uh, uh, there's a price to pay. Uh, if this lives longer, this is shorter. So we have done this. Uh, it's a little bit technically more difficult to, do, to switch off the laser quickly. But typically, we can see uh, a lifetime which is four or five times faster than the independent atom lifetime. Uh, and this decays faster than the single atom. So this we have seen, and this will, uh, will appear soon as well. Uh, there's some uh, 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 spin to this. It's very different from what, can, what you can do in the forward direction. In the forward direction, you can describe all this with an index of refraction with the mean field. But we also look in the, uh, uh, at the uh, large angle. And so in the, at this large angle where we do the experiment, there's no mean field approach to describe this fast decaying. So it's only the decay superradiance mechanism which can explain this. OK, and then, uh, so, okay, so, so far, this seems to say that, OK, under localization, we didn't, no one saw it in the experiment. Uh, the theory says maybe it doesn't exist. And we see subradiance, so that could be more or less the end of the story. Uh, but of course, there's uh, there are a lot of clever people around, and they, uh, they make proposals how to get around some no-go theories. And so uh, one of these is uh, what we do uh, with uh, Luca Celado. So there's a proposal how to, to solve this problem of uh, under localization uh, <coughs> uh, with our system. So the, uh, this is first a toy model. And the toy model takes uh, up uh, uh, the standard Anderson model on the lattice and adds opening here to uh, the same channel here. So that's the toy model just to, to combine Anderson type of physics to a uh, thicker type of super and sub radiance and to see how can you play with this uh, two, two effects. And uh, so what we saw is that uh, uh, in the Hilbert space, you can separate uh, two things. You separate the super radiant state and the sub radiant states. And if you look at the super radiant states, uh, you will not uh, see any under localization. I will not go into detail, but the super radiant state, they are very strongly coupled to the outside field and they just leave very quickly. But the sub radiant state, somehow they live in a closed system. So they don't know that there's an open system outside. They, they, they feel more this Hamiltonian closed system. And what we see is that there's a, uh, the sub radiant state, they are still uh, subject to the under localization if you add uh, additional diagonal disorder on, the, on this uh, lattice system. So we see that uh, here we can uh, get under localization of the subradiant uh, states. And uh, the shape of these states has a, a, what you call hybrid states. It has this Anderson localized peak, and it has some plateau, which is the residual of this thicker subradiant uh, extended state. So this has been seen now in the in numerics in the, in the kind of toy model. And uh, we have done this now uh, in the more realistic uh, model, which is uh, in progress here. But, uh, we are confident that in the Hamiltonian we use, to, uh, where the initial prediction was that there's no under localization, using additional diagonal, diagonal disorder, we might be able to localize photons in this system. So that's uh, very important because there seems to be a route around this no go theorem for under localization in cold atoms. And so this is uh, something we want to, if this is really, uh, if you are confident enough on this theory, that's what we're going to do in the experiment very soon. Um, and so now I come to, yeah, to the conclusion. So we want to, we're still optimistic that maybe there's a route for under localization. Uh, Sergei Skipetrov has another proposal by adding a, a strong magnetic fields to solve this type of problems. We'll see what type of route we will uh, solve. There is still a problem that uh, if the uh, Hamiltonian approach says that there's under localization, uh, the main problem is that we don't know how to see it from outside because we can go inside the, uh, the cloud, of, cloud, of, cloud of cold atoms. So there's still an important issue how to measure it. 
And there are some technical issues which you don't care about, but I, for me it's very important. Uh, probably we need to switch atoms from rubidium to iterbium, uh, which is uh, f uh, a big issue for us, but uh, not relevant here. Uh, and then, so then, the, this is all about how the uh, internal degrees of freedom can be uh, uh, sensitive to this long-range coupling or underslocalization. And then there's uh, the, the whole other uh, regime where I look at the motion of the atoms, which I shortly mentioned at the beginning of my talk, photon bubbles. So we look for the, at the bi-screening. Can, we, can the, uh, this repulsion between atoms make an arrangement of the atoms, which is a little bit more subtle than just a homogeneous distribution? Uh, I would be very happy if I could find a way uh, to change the sign of this Coulomb repulsion, because right now I said that one atom pushes the other atom away, but uh, there are dipole forces in cold atoms which might make us attract, so if we can get a long-range attractive force in three dimensions, that would be very nice. Uh, and uh, then another question, that's a question for, for this community, this fast and slow relaxation, super and subradiance, which scales like the system size, uh, which exploits this one over R connection, uh, maybe it's connected to this quasi-stationary state, so we had some discussions with some people of, uh, here, so uh, maybe there's some connections. Maybe you could some, find some scaling laws, analytical scaling laws, how this super and subradiant scale uh, should, should, uh, should scale. And uh, I uh, want to finish, but I want to first to mention all uh, the people who work on this. As we heard before, experimental uh, efforts uh, implies a, a huge number of people uh, which are not listed here. This is just the people who are right now in the lab, but uh, over the last 10 years, there, are, there might be 20 people have been working on this. Uh, Guillaume Laberie is the mastermind be, be, behind all this uh, backscattering weak localization experiment. William Guerin is the PI on this uh, subradiant state. And Mathilde Fouché just joined us uh, on the random lasing part, and uh, these are students uh, working on this project. And, um, uh, and these are all the collaborators, which are, of course, very important for us because uh, first they give us new ideas. Uh, they say that we are maybe on the right track. Uh, so we have uh, Luca here, Romain is here, uh, Julien is here, Marco, uh, Bruno is here. So many people uh, you know here uh, are very important for us because this gives us new ideas and uh, gives us a solution to how to proceed, proceed in, in this uh, uh, fight. Uh, our main thing is under organization of light, uh, just to mention this. And with this, I thank you for your attention.